Hi, I'm Ellen Besner of the CJN Daily, sponsored by Metropia. The impact of Pope Francis's recent visit to Canada is still being felt in First Nation communities, as is his apology to Indigenous people for the genocide by some members of the Catholic Church of First Nation families, especially children, at residential schools. The Pope's visit comes just before Canada marks its second National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, and this year, that day, September 30th, coincides with the weeks when Jews are in the middle of our high holidays. As you know, I'm out of the office this week, but we're bringing you my encore presentation of an interview I did with a Jewish Indigenous couple. He's Jewish, she's Anishinaabe, and why they'll likely be wearing orange shirts again this year. That's an honor song performed by Bob Goulet. He's an educator from the Nipissing First Nation of Northern Ontario. He sang and drummed to lift up the spirits of the 4,000 to 6,000 missing and murdered Indigenous children who didn't survive Canada's residential school system. Goulet performed it recently for Toronto's Congregation Habonim Synagogue at an event they put on not long after hundreds of graves of residential school children were discovered in B.C. and Saskatchewan in the summer. Today, Thursday, September 30th, is the first National Day of Truth and Reconciliation in Canada. The Liberal government chose to designate this new national statutory holiday to honour the lost children and to honour the thousands of survivors of residential schools, their families and communities. September 30th is also Orange Shirt Day in Canada. It's to honour a First Nations woman, Phyllis Webstab. When she was six years old, she wore a new orange shirt on her first day at a residential school in B.C., but she was forced to strip and take it off. Well, that's not going to happen to the orange shirts that Bradley Ockrant and Donnell Clark are wearing. He's Jewish. She's Anishinaabe. The couple will be proudly wearing their Every Child Matter shirts on Thursday, and so will their three daughters. I don't want anyone in our family to have to go through any of the atrocities that on both sides, the Native side and the Jewish side, have experienced. And we should be, at this point in the human history, we should be beyond that now. Bradley Ockrant grew up in the heavily Jewish community of Thornhill, Ontario. Ten years ago, after high school, he was accepted to a college film production program in Thunder Bay. Within weeks of arriving there, he met Danelle Clark, the granddaughter of a residential school survivor. They actually met through Facebook. At first, she didn't know he was Jewish. At first, he thought she was Asian. They've been together ever since. The couple lives in Beardmore, Ontario, which is a community of 250 people. It's where Danelle's from. She's a member of the Bingui, Nayashi, and Anishinaabek First Nation, located on the Trans-Canada Highway, a 16-hour drive north of Toronto on Lake Nipigon. Although Bradley and Danelle knew hardly anything about each other's cultures when they met, They've discovered the legacy of racism and genocide that has impacted both their peoples over the generations. Coming up, you'll meet them and hear how he confronts the challenges of being the only Jewish man for miles around, while she deals with prejudice against Indigenous people and her family's legacy as survivors of the residential school system. Danelle Clark's ancestors were forced off their land twice, first in the 50s, when government hydro work flooded their homes, and then for good in 1960 when the Ontario government kicked them all out to create a provincial park. Danelle's grandfather and his brother were sent to a residential school in Thunder Bay, likely St. Joseph's. In recent years, the band is slowly starting to reclaim their land. This summer, in Beardmore, where Bradley and Danelle live, there was a boil water advisory and the smoke from wildfires kept everybody indoors. So they took their girls to Thornhill to visit family in late August, where I had the chance to interview them. So tell us a little bit about the legacy of residential school in your own family, uh, first of all, Danielle. I know you've talked a bit about it um, in, on Facebook a little bit. I'm not sure what the name was, but anybody who has Google can look it up. It was the only residential school in Thunder Bay where my grandfather and his oldest brother were sent to again their parents were addicts into drinking uh, his his mother had died of cirrhosis on the liver so you know the, the lineage of alcoholism and addiction goes back forever with us 
Yeah, and right. it's everywhere. But again, they were, they lived out in the bush in the middle of nowhere where his father had worked, you know, back in the day where wood and everything was a big thing up there. So they got sent out to residential schools. They spent most of their young years, from what I understand there. And they have many stories of running away, being caught, being brought back. You know, the whole sad story of, you know, looking out the window and mom and dad are coming to get us or. But when he was in residential school, he suffered a lot of abuse, and he doesn't talk too. He much doesn't about talk about it very much. Um, but there's one story about the the boy who always peed his bed. Yes. I don't know if you want to mention that story as. Uh, yeah, he didn't. He said specifically he didn't get beat up, but he's also a very light skinned green eyed person. He doesn't look very native if you look straight on at him. But he always told me this one story that there was a boy in, because they all just had beds lined up in a big room, you know, kid, kid, kid after each color in a bed. But he said a boy, a boy who was uh, in a bed close to him would often wet his bed and they would like grab his face and shove it in it and like, you know, make him clean it up and he'd have to do it every day. Like, and the kids would he said the kids would get together and try to help him clean it up before the, any of the the adults found it because to avoid from him getting beat or w whatever else they were going to do and it was definitely a tra traumatizing time for all these kids so all the stuff that you know and bradley you came into this family how aware were you when you first moved to thunder bay about the abuse that happened in Thunder Bay, even the last few, you know, for years, as well as the personal specific stories about uh, your your wife's family. No, and that's the sad fact. I was completely ignorant to all this going on. And in fact, when I moved up and she's telling me all about racism and how it's hard for the natives, and I'm thinking, well, how can that be? I said, you know, we're in the 21st century now. Is a racism supposed to be long gone? Of course, there's, you know, a, stuff happening in the states and you know all over the place but compared to how it was and uh and i was like surprised to see that this is still an ongoing thing all the time it hasn't changed at all oh i can't walk into a shopping store in thunder bay i can't walk in without them following me or you know security following me around watching what i do and stuff like that and no and her her brother actually is a very good example he wore suits to high school every day to show everybody he was different so they wouldn't look at him as categorize yeah, him categorize as him as a as a an, another native at one point it was almost like he was ashamed no so let's talk about the jewish aspect when you met bradley right did you know about the legacy of the holocaust anti-semitism what did you know well when i was growing up my grandparents used to tease me there i was born in a uh, raised in a christian home and my grandparents used to tease me that I'm going to find a nice Jewish guy one day and that will be my husband. So sure enough, it worked out. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, growing up, you know, I never really knew too much. Except about the Holocaust, you learn about that in school and, you know, all the movies there are to it behind it. So I had a little bit of knowledge, but from, I don't think I met anyone Jewish before in my life before him. I don't know, like now that I've been around it so much, I can kind of tell when someone's a little bit Jewish and stuff, but I- <laughs> Getting your Jewish radar going. All right, yeah. so tell me about your shirts. You're wearing orange shirts. Um, I didn't ask you to wear them. We? <laughs> no, we did anyway. Your whole family's wearing them. A friend of mine who lives in Rocky Bay, the reserve near Beer and Moore, um, when this all started coming out, she owns a little company where she sells clothes and stuff. She made these shirts and was selling them. And whatever she made for profit, she would donate to uh, an organization that was helping all the residential school findings and stuff like that. So as soon as she did that, I wanted to order for everyone for the family and everything. And I thought it was important for us to wear it. On Canada's day, we wore them all. And on the 30th, we'll wear them. And we plan on wearing them when we go to Wonderland. You know, I don't mind showing it off. The more people that see it, maybe the more awareness it'll bring what is that like having three daughters who are um indigenous slash jewish i've said multiple times i won't move back to thunder bay thunder bay has got so bad 
and you know it's it's the main city in northern Ontario so all the reserves and everything people are always coming down to Thunder Bay for you know shopping or medical reasons or anything like that but it had like the crime and the drugs and everything has gotten so bad I don't and the racism I don't want to raise native girls there it wasn't too long ago a native woman died because a group Barbara of kids, Penter, yes, yeah, she was known in my family. Through a uh, trailer hitch at her, and they thought it was funny. And as they drove off, uh, one of the guys said, I hit one, you know, and this is the that kind was of. That Bushby. He got eight years just now, yeah, or just recently, yeah. he got sentenced to eight years. Clearly, that kid, I mean, maybe it's from his experiences, maybe it's from his friends, maybe it's from his family. But, and the problem is that all it takes is one group of people to start spreading this hate, and then everybody else spreads the hate. And the as a Jew, knowing how far it can go, right? And um, so when I hear stuff that's racist towards natives, it really pisses me off because I don't want anyone in our family to have to go through any of the atrocities that on both sides, the native side and the Jewish side have experienced. And we should be, at this point in the human history, we should be beyond that now. You know, we should be past, you know, all this hate and this sad thing is that you're never going to be away from hate you know there's always going to be people who don't like you because you're different or or whatever and then having children grow up in this this type of world that you know uh, you just don't want that for them and you know they're going to be stereotyped because they're jewish and they're going to be seen as cheap or whatever the case is and but then also they're brown skin they're very clearly brown skin and they're going to be stereotyped because they're native right and it it sucks because they're going to have to try harder than everybody else to prove that um, they're not what people think of them, right? Which is sad. No one should have to try harder to prove you're a productive member of society, you know? You started counting on your Facebook page when they started finding graves and you kept the running score. I don't know, that's I, not the right yeah. word, but I've been watching, you know, why did you do that? And and how has it been to see this summer, the discoveries of these graves for you both? My heart has hurt a lot in the last little bit. It, it's disgusting. It's absolutely disgusting how much. And I think uh, I wrote down the numbers, actually. We're in the six of thousands already, 6,000. You know, I went to see some concentration camps when I was 17. Uh, I went to Poland, I went to Auschwitz, and they had a case with all the shoes. And there was a little, little girl shoe, tiny little white shoe right in the front. And I'm, I'm sure they placed it there on purpose. But it was a very heavy heart, heart uh, hitting moment when you realize not, not everybody was safe from the, tr the trauma and the, the pain. And so when they're discovering all these children it's their children they're not grown-ups they're not um they're not graves they're no you they're know, they were a hole children on top of each other all ages five years old four years old ten someone years young old, as two you yeah, know like babies thrown being into in a, a ditch and, and covered and that was it we're at six thousand five hundred and two out of 20 20 places that they searched so far and there was 139 schools in canada and it's never been a secret to the atrocities that the residential schools had. And, you know, it's not like um, this is uh, un unheard of information. We knew the whole time that residential schools were bad. Well, I knew as soon as I got into the community. But what's bringing this so to light is the magnitude is that all these children that were just shoved into a pile and buried, not marked, not and families, not hidden. notified, hidden away from the rest of the world like they didn't matter and that's the um, that's the part that connects the jewish history with the with the native histories they were seen as vermin just like how the jews were that diseased there was something wrong with them and the whole point of the residential schools was to beat the demon out of them right that that was that was the whole point of they the were dirty yeah, yeah tried to wash them clean they would be deloused and everything trying to scrubbed you know, with bleach and stuff like that I'm trying to clean everybody and because they they were seen as yeah like Danelle said dirty or or um unclean you know and that's uh which just is you're only one step away from a complete genocide and then now we're finding all these children that are being dug up and you realize this 
was a genocide. It wasn't on the verge of being one. It was. It was a genocide for the children. Well, this summer, the Canadian government uh, brought in for the first time, I know that Orange Shirt Day existed for a while, but now it's going to be a federal statutory holiday. Um, It's called uh, National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. It's a new federal holiday. Uh, what do you make of that? Is that uh, important to you at all? Is it? Is it? Does it help you? Does it? You know, what, how do you feel about this? I love that again. The recon, uh, it's being recognized. You know, all over Canada now, people will have another holiday, and maybe they'll learn about why it's a holiday. Yeah. And uh, again, the truth or the history behind it, and mm-hmm. awareness. Again, this is people learning about it. I know. I don't, I don't mean to say this any rudely or anything, but a lot of white people don't know about what natives have been through or what we're going through. I should tell you that being the only Jewish person for miles has also been a challenge for Bradley Ockrand. And it's not just because he has to improvise making the traditional Jewish holiday foods because he can't get it up there, except when his mom ships up boxes of matzo ball mix and those little yellow croutons. But he also has had to face what he refers to as innocent racism. Comments and jokes made around him about the Holocaust, about showers, about burning in fires and things like that. And when these things happen, he tells the people it's not okay and why. And that's what Jewish Canada sounds like for this episode of the CJN Daily, sponsored by Metropia. And we'll end the episode with more from Bob Goulet, the Anishinaabe educator we heard at the opening performing the honor song about what you could do for National Truth and Reconciliation Day. I do urge each and every one of you, as you begin or continue your work in reconciliation, to do one of a number of things. I ask you to commit to lifelong learning about Indigenous peoples. Take a look at Chapter 4 of Unmarked Graves in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's final report. Read the stories that are contained in the TRC's final report and get to know those 94 calls to action. The second call that I'm asking you is to begin or continue your role in being an ally. Learn about what it means to be an ally, to show that support and that unconditional love and respect that you have for all First Nations, Métis and Inuit people. And finally, I do ask you to put down your tobacco, offer your prayers, offer your words uh, to the spirit. No matter what uh, spirit uh, you identify with, no matter how you call the spirit, to do that in a good way. And think of those families, those communities, and the loved ones who are remembering and who are hurting at this time in mourning the loss of those that didn't come back from residential schools. 